At the Natural History Museum, we study and share stories of the amazing nature in and around Los Angeles from the past, present, and future. Each week in this webinar series, we'll learn how and why we study nature in Los Angeles and hear from a different museum staff member who will take us behind the scenes or out into the field, showcasing the real specimens and tools they use in their work at the museum. Last week, we heard from Jorge Velasuarbe about why Ellie's marine mammals are so special. Today, we'll be all about the reptiles and amphibians of Los Angeles and how we learn about them. Before we meet our guest, we're going to start with a warm-up activity that will get us thinking about reptiles and amphibians. The next six images are going to be reptiles and amphibians spotted by iNaturalist users. Your job is to guess whether the animals can be found in Southern California and to notice anything that they might have in common with one another. You can write your answers in your journal, type them into the chat, or say them out loud if you're somewhere that it's okay to do so. We're gonna go a little bit fast on this. Um, so is everybody ready to go? All right, let's get started. So here is our first iNaturalist photo. What do we think? Can we find this animal in Southern California? I'm seeing some answers come into the chat. Now, if you are thinking, yes, you are correct. This is a Western, Western fence lizard. Um, and this one was spotted in the North Arroyo in Pasadena, California. All right, let's keep going. So what do we think about this one? Is this a reptile that can be found in Southern California? Let's see. If you're thinking, yes, you are correct. This is a Western skink. It was spotted in Malibu Creek State Park, just outside of uh, the city. All right, moving right along. Okay, let's see, what about this one? Is this a reptile that can be found in Southern California? Does it have anything in common with the other animals we've seen so far? All right, yes again, this is a gopher snake. It was spotted in Castaic, California. I remember as we're looking at these, we're trying to think about what they have in common as well as whether we can find them living in Southern California. All right, our next two, are these reptiles that can be found in Southern California? I'm seeing a lot of answers coming in, let's see. Yes, again, these are Southern alligator lizards. They were spotted in Tournament Park in Pasadena. All right. What about this one? Can this be found in Southern California? What do you think? Share your answer in the chat or write it down in your journal. All right, the answer is yes again. This is a Western toad and it was spotted in San Gabriel, California. All right, this is our last one. Remember, we're trying to decide if this is an animal from Southern California and also, does it have anything in common with the other animals we've seen? What do you think? This is an animal that can be found in Southern California. <laughs> yes. This Monterey Essentina salamander was actually spotted in the Santa Monica Mountains. Thank you so much for playing, everybody. <laughs> now, you probably noticed that all of these animals were found in Southern California. Now, our other question, did these animals have anything in common? You can see them all again on your screen right now. Um, if you notice anything that they have in common, you can share it in the chat, you can write it down in your notebook, you can share it out loud um, if you are in the room with somebody. Let's see, I'm seeing some comments come into the chat. They're all reptiles. Do they have any features that look common? What do we notice when we look at them? 
Yeah, let's see. I'm seeing some folks are noticing that they have a similar color, similar pattern. They all have scales. They are all cute. They have some things in common and some things that are a little bit different. Yeah, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, now that we have our brains on reptiles and amphibians, we're going to little, learn a little bit more about how we study them at the museum. Uh, so today's special guest is Neftali Camacho, or Nefti for short. Nefti is the collections manager of herpetology at the Natural History Museum. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So hi, Nefti. We're really happy to have you with us today. Hi, thank you all for having me. I'm very Nefti. excited to be here. We're super excited to have you. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about your work at the museum? Yeah, so, um, so I am the collection manager of herpetology. So that's reptiles and amphibians. And I basically manage a very large collection of preserved dead reptiles and amphibians that are kept in jars similar, similar to these. So picture a large room full of specimens about 195,000 estimate of compacted and put into shelves and organized. So think of me, I like to compare it as a librarian, but instead of books, I work with dead reptiles and amphibians. Um, and the collection is mainly used for researchers. So researchers do contact me and very similar to books, they actually could borrow specimens and study them. They either come here or we actually ship them out as well. There's, there's special ways of shipping out specimens. So that's my kind of my job in a nutshell and what I do here. Awesome. Um, Nefti, are there any like specific tools that you use in your work? Yes, yeah, so uh, part of my job not only is organizing the specimens, making sure that the data is incorporated into our database, which is accessible to researchers all over the world. I'm also in charge of preserving specimens. So a lot of the specimens that we get, they did die and we get them in various forms. Some of them are roadkill. Some of them, some people bring us things that have died in their pool. Usually in the summertime, a lot of lizards are out and about um, and I have to preserve them. So what that entails is, as you know, when things die, they're, they're mushy and they rot. So what I do, is I preserve them with a chemical called um, formaldehyde. And I have a, a jug here. Now this is actually pretty toxic. Right now it's closed so I could have it with me. But when I work with the specimens, um, so I, I'll get a, either a, like, for example, a dead um, roadkill snake. I work under a hood and I wear not in addition, I also wear this mask. So this mask protects me from the fumes of the formaldehyde which is basically a 10% uh, solution of formaldehyde. When it's in liquid form, it's called formalin. Um, and I use this and this helps me um, work with a formaldehyde without being exposed to any of the fumes. Um, and essentially what I do is I have a small jar of formaldehyde. I put a syringe, extract the liquid and literally just inject either the lizard or snake that I'm preserving. Now, when I preserve them, usually lizards or frogs that have appendages or arms and legs, I preserve them this way. So they look like this. And the reason why I do that, because it makes it very easy for a researcher when they come into the collection um, and to preserve that way, they could take measurements very easily without any of the legs getting um, in the way of taking measurements. As for snakes, uh, what I do is I actually preserve them. As you know, when a snake dies, um, especially if it's a, a road coast specimen, they don't come looking very nice. So what I have to do is I actually do put in the guts back into the body um, and then inject the entire snake with formaldehyde using a fairly large syringe. Uh, and then I coil the snake. And the reason why I coil the snake is because we need to put them in jars like this. So I coil the snake and the snake stays that way forever. So it's easy for me to place it in the jar and also remove it when I need to. So those are little tips of the trade when preserving reptiles and amphibians for research. Um, in addition, if you're wondering what liquid we use once the specimen gets into the jar, we normal, no longer use formaldehyde because we wanna be able to work with the specimens. 
um, and using formaldehyde. Back in the old days, they used to do that, but they learn better now. So now we use alcohol. Um, essentially, it's just a 70% solution of alcohol. That rest of it is water. So this uh, jar is filled with alcohol. Now I can actually take out the specimen, not worry about working with a specimen under a fume hood because it's just alcohol. And the alcohol basically keeps any fungus or, and also keeps the specimen um, from drying up. Uh, so the specimens always have to be submerged in alcohol. When I work with them, I do have a small uh, squirt bottle of alcohol that I use to squirt the specimens while I'm looking at them and they're out of their jars. Because once the specimen dries up, they can become damaged. And if you're wondering how long a specimen lasts in this condition, it's been estimated that it can last up to 300 years. So they'll definitely be around way before me, way after me, actually. So it's, it's very cool to think that, that these specimens can be used for so long to continue doing research on them. That's awesome. So you work with, it sounds like a lot of chemicals and you're doing stuff that's going to be kind of helping the museum learn about reptiles, not just today, but also well into the future. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Well, Nefti, could you tell us a little bit about how you kind of ended up studying reptiles and amphibians at the museum and kind of what, what your yeah. path was like? Yeah. So I grew up in Los Angeles and I remember um, I've always liked monster movies, and specifically, I liked um, this guy, Godzilla. I was a big fan of Godzilla, even growing up. I'm going to date myself. This is an old VHS tape from the 80s. They're no longer used, but we used to watch movies on VH VHS tapes, and Godzilla is essentially a large lizard, large reptile, and I just, like, fell in love with Godzilla, and that eventually opened the doors for me to read and learn more about reptiles. Uh, eventually I started um, having lizards as pets. I had a, a few snakes growing up um, and I went into college with a zoology degree. So that's what I, that was my major. And I was very excited and couldn't wait to start taking the classes for herpetology, which is reptiles and amphibians. Uh, so that was kind of my uh, like a fun pathway I, I got to learn about reptiles and amphibians. Um, and ever since then, I've just been fascinated by them, particularly because most people like animals, right? And, and usually when people say they love animals, they often refer to the, the, the mammals, you know, or, or the birds. And often case, sometimes reptiles and amphibians are often, people are often scared of them or they don't understand them. So that, 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 really appealed to me, helping people understand their beauty and their importance in the environment. Um, so that's one of my driving forces in working with uh, reptiles and amphibians. That is so cool, Nefti. And I'm gonna chime in and ask a couple of questions that I have as well. Um, so how are LA's reptiles and amphibians special? Um, what makes them so unique? Yeah, so usually when people talk, think, talk about diversity, they often think of tropical environments um, like the Amazon and such, but LA is actually quite diverse and it's especially with reptiles and amphibians. And I brought out some that I'd like to show you and share. Um, so I'll start off with the native reptiles and amphibians. So those are things, those are reptiles and amphibians that are actually have always lived here. Um, and one of the most um, common ones that most people have seen if you live here um, and I'm going to go ahead and take it out and I'm going to pop up this table so I could give myself a little room. Yep. Another tool I use is often forceps. Um, so let's see. So, and normally, you know, I, I also have gloves available, but since I am working with alcohol and for me, it doesn't really bother me. The worst it can do is dry my hands. I, I'm okay with it. But let's see if you can see this. So this is a Western fence lizard. These are very common. You can find these in your backyard, um, pretty much all over the place. Um, and I know it's a little hard to see, but this is a male. You can see the blue on the belly. They also refer to them as blue bellies. And they're the ones that you see often doing the push-ups, and that's trying to impress a female or even trying to intimidate a rival male. Uh, so that's one example of a lizard 
that you can find here. Um, they also have these really spiky kind of jaggedy scales along their back. Um, so that's one example among others that are pretty common is this one here. And I believe they showed this particular species in the images that you were looking at earlier. This is an alligator lizard. And as you can see, you can see why I call it an alligator lizard because it kind of resembles a little alligator. And often cases, people confuse these for snakes because they, their limbs are very slim and their body is very elongated and they have this really long tail. They're pretty fast. So if you're not looking too closely, I've been, you know, I've, I've had people tell me that, oh, I saw this, this, this snake and they show me a picture and I actually could tell it's an alligator lizard. They just didn't look at close enough. But it's, I mean, it's an honest mistake. You can see why they, they might confuse it for a snake. And these are also very important for the environment. They do a lot, eat a lot of insects. Um, they are predatory, predatory. Um, and the, you can also find them pretty much, you could see them in your backyard, parks, um, they're pretty, have a wide range of habitats that they inhabit. Um, both the Western fence lizard and the alligator lizard have become used to humans. So they, they live in around um, areas where people live looking for food, often cases around trash cans because, you know, trash cans do attract flies and bugs. They're eating the bugs. So yeah, they're really, really interesting animals. In addition, there are more lizards. Um, this one is often confused with a Western fence lizard, particularly with the younger, the juveniles, because they are a little harder to tell when they're younger. Um, so these, let me see if I could, yeah, this one's good, is a slight side blotched lizard. And you can see, like, see if I could pull up his arm. On the side of his arm, he has, or she, has a little blotch, hence the name side blotch lizards. These look like juvenile Western fence lizards. People often confuse them. Again, they're kind of hard to tell, but these are side blotch. And then these, they also have this little dark patch under their chin. Um, these are smaller. These you also find, um, you can see them. These are more, I, I, I usually notice these more around parks more not as urban areas, although you could probably get some there as well. Um, and these are smaller than our, than the Western fence lizards you see around here. Um, but these, again, these are called side blotch lizards. Uh, and then among amphibians, we have, I brought out two particular ones. This one, is a Pacific tree frog. And again, you usually find, uh, again, amphibians somewhere close to water. So either a river or a lake or a park that has water. Um, these are Pacific tree frogs. These get fairly small. Um, this is pretty much an adult size. Um, often case, if you're gonna see a frog around here, this is probably the one you're gonna see. Um, again, they, they're, you, you could hear them, you know, croak if you're out in by, by an area where there's um, water. Um, it's most likely these little fellas here. So really, really cool, interesting animals. And another one that's probably a little harder to spot, but if you're ever out in the San Gabriel Mountains by a, a creek, um, they prefer, um, you won't see these in, in urban more ur areas, there'll be more parks. They are called the California newt. So these are in the same group as salamanders. Um, and California newts, this specimen is a little dull in color. So if you're wondering, um, alcohol over time and also light exposure, a lot of our specimens are kept in the dark. They do bleach out the color in the specimen. So this is a very old specimen. I can tell you just by looking at the color. So uh, California newts are generally very bright. They're like a bright orange. And the reason why is that they are considered uh, poisonous 
So if another animal tries to eat it, it will get sick and potentially could die. Um, so it's basically it's advertising itself as saying, don't eat me, um, I am uh, poisonous. Um, so that's why they have a very bright uh, orange color. Um, and you find these again in lakes um, and, and streams, um, uh, you know, around parks or uh, nature kind of uh, areas. Uh, again, really cool animals. And they are considered highly uh, uh, poisonous. So um, even if you touch it, um, it can irritate the skin. But again, that's used mainly for protecting itself from, from predators. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're very, very neat animals. Now, I mentioned just a few. There's actually a lot more. But I mentioned just a few native reptiles and amphibians. And now I'm going to actually show you some that are living here, but they've actually been introduced over time. What I mean by that is that they now are established here, uh, meaning they are having their breeding here um, and they've been introduced through various means, whether it's been the pet trade um, uh, through uh, plants that um, sometimes get shipped over here, they'll come in plants. And, um, and yeah, and I'll give you a little insights about each one. Uh, the first one, or first two, I should say, I wanna talk about, Again, I'm gonna take these out because I feel they're a little easier to see out of the jar. And these two are very similar. So you're not gonna see much difference. You're probably gonna wonder like, oh, they look the same to me. But again, the color of the alcohol, I mean, the color within the alcohol sometimes bleaches out and I'll describe what they actually should look like. So this is um, the green anole and this is the brown anole. These are very popular pets. In fact, this is probably the, as if I could remember correctly, this is the first pet I have actually had growing up. The reason they're so popular because they're, they're very cool lizards. They don't get very big. They're easy to take care of. Um, and this is, these are adult size. Problem is that a lot of people um, don't realize that they're excellent it's escape artists. Um, if you don't have a very good uh, terrarium with a locking mechanism or they could easily get out um, and they've adapted to living here. So now you find brown and green anoles in certain areas of LA County um, and they're not supposed to actually be here. Uh, and there's different things that can happen with that. So they could either um, compete with our native lizards, which is a bad thing. Um, and um, because they're also eating the same insects that they are eating, uh, but they tend to hang out a little bit by um, above ground, more higher than um, our Western fence lizards. Um, so yeah, so they're, they could be directly competing with them. They're still studying them. So that's one of the things that we are studying here. They're studying how the non-native species like these anoles are interacting with native species like the Western fence lizard, the Southern alligator lizard I showed you earlier because there could potentially be some problems with that. Um, so these are, are again, anole lizards and these were introduced through the pet trade. So that's why if you ever have pets, make sure that you're responsible and that you keep them in the uh, terrarium and if you don't want them anymore make sure you give them to a person or even a shelter that could take care of them never release these animals out into the wild because you don't know what kind of um consequences that could you know that could entail um yeah so i'll put these back and show you the next species that is considered now uh non-native. So this one, there's an interesting story. Let me see if I could pull. And just dab it a little bit, making sure they're, they're a little drippy because they're in alcohol. Um, this is a European wall lizard. So you're probably wondering, European? How did that get into LA? <laughs> so the, um, a while back, um, uh, so these are, they also refer to them as uh, Italian wall lizards. So, so they're from Italy. Um, apparently these were introduced by a person who brought them over on a, with a suitcase, on a suitcase. They, he, he 
because this person brought several of, of, of them. And European wall lizards, or they also refer to them as Italian wall lizards, live in a very similar climate to ours. It's Mediterranean, so Italy has a very similar climate to ours. So they adapted very well to living here. They bred and eventually they became established in parts of LA County. So now they're around. The issue with these is that they're a little bit more aggressive than the gnolls that I was talking about earlier. These are predaceous. Not only do they eat, um, uh, they, they also eat berries. They've been known to eat berries. They eat bugs. And we also think that they probably eat um, juvenile Western fence lizards, um, uh, baby, you know, young ones. So that's a direct hit on our native species. So again, this is why it's not a good idea to ever release any kind of non-native animal into the environment. Um, and they are very beautiful as well. And let me show you a picture of them that I have. So this is a picture. So you can see it's eating a bird egg. They eat anything. So that's why they're kind of like, um, you know, a, a not really good for the environment. And again, I'm not saying that these animals are bad. They're just, unfortunately, they were introduced in a place where they're not supposed to be. So they could, um, you know, have negative effects on the environment. But this is what they look like when they're actually alive, they're this pretty green, green color. Um, so you can tell immediately that this lizard does not belong here. This, there's no lizards in our area that look like this with this kind of color. Um, and again, that's the Italian wall lizard. And let me put them back. And then, one of the other ones I like to show you, actually, this is the last non-native that I brought out. It's a big one. So I'm gonna attempt to take it out, but I'm gonna be over here because it's, it's uh, I don't wanna wet my laptop, so we'll see. Oh, this is a tough jar. Okay, here we go. So this is an amphibian, by the way. We're now in, uh, I'm gonna show you a non-native amphibian. And oh. so this is a American bullfrog. These have been around for many, many, many decades. They were introduced a very long time ago. Um, and the problem with these is that they get huge. This is still a like a sub adult. This is not adult. Adults could get much, like maybe twice the size. Um, and frogs in general, what they do is they pretty much go after anything that could fit in their mouth. So they don't discriminate. As long as it could fit in their mouth, they will try to eat it, regardless of what it is. <laughs> um, that's one of the biggest problems with these frogs is that um, they will eat anything from baby birds, lizards other frogs, um, you name it, as long as it could fit in the mouth. In fact, here's a picture of one. Let's see. Trying to devour a snake. There you go. And now you can see how these immediately are a problem because they um, are eating our, not our native species. Um, and there are programs that they're trying to um, get rid of them. Um, you know, now I think they're, they've, they've done a really good job. Um, we don't have um, as many as we used to, but I even remember growing up, um, I, I'm from West Covina, and I, I, I remember growing up and I would go to one of the parks, um, it was the, the, by the La Puente Mall, and um, I remember I didn't know what kind of frogs things were or anything. I just knew they were cool. So I remember growing up and I would go to a stream. Um, and again, this is a park that's visited by all kinds of, you know, a lot of people. And I remember seeing these large tadpoles, like large, huge. And I thought to myself, oh, that's cool. Like that they must live here. It turns out that those tadpoles were the tadpoles of American bullfrog. Now I know but I had no idea back then. So could you only imagine as those tadpoles got older, what they ate around that park? <laughs> um, 
but yeah, either way, it's a fun story that I that I always remember every time I work with, you know, work with bullfrogs that I did remember seeing these large tadpoles and here, the non native the native frogs, their tadpoles don't get that size. So I knew that it, it wasn't something native. It was it was it was most likely um, American bullfrogs. So yeah, yeah. Um, and these are from the east. They're not they're not from out here. Um, and they were introduced, if you're wondering. So from what I understand, they were introduced through the food industry. Apparently, back then, many, many decades ago, um, they were hoping that, you know, in some places in, in the U.S., people like to eat frog legs. And they were hoping that they thought that um, here in California, that industry would take off. So they brought frog, uh, American bullfrogs and, and, you know, they're big and meaty, um, but people here didn't like them. So what they did is they released them, many of them. So that's how they became established here. So they're one of the most um, established non-native species we've had for a very long time. Uh, many people that, like myself, I thought even thought they were supposed to be here, you know, because I had no idea. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's um, unfortunately now they're they're having the the populations more under control. So I'll put this thing back. <laughs> that was so cool. I am so glad we got to see a real behind the scenes look at the collections and some of these amazing specimens. This is really neat. Yeah, it's very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen some of those before and those really blew my mind. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, have... no problem. My pleasure. <laughs> we have tons of questions from students. So if you don't mind, I might just jump right into them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll start with some collections related questions because some sure. students were asking, um, and we had a lot of students that were curious kind of how the museum gets the specimens and you maybe hinted to some of that before and then why do we preserve them can you remind us of kind of the purpose of preserving these specimens sure so um so yeah i mentioned before um, some of our specimens especially during the summer, su summer months um come from roadkill so we often get snakes who um during um as the evening gets cooled down they'll, they'll like to warm themselves up on the road and unfortunately that's not a good place to be so i often get snakes um that way lizards sometimes i get them um from uh, from pools um people have their pools um usually uncovered during the summer so lizards will jump in and and die um and i get them that way and then um another way we get them is so so basically I'm, as I mentioned, the collection manager, but there's also someone called the curator. And that person essentially is my boss. And um, uh, he or she uh, is the one who actually studies them. And for, to, for you to study um, a certain group of animals, um, sometimes it requires having many of them. So uh, the curators or researchers um, have permits. That are allowed, they are allowed to actually collect specimens only a certain amount, and they actually do uh, unfortunately sacrifice them, but for the greater good. Now you're probably wondering, like, oh, that sounds terrible, right? But if you think about it, my job is to preserve them. My job is to make sure that they are studied for a very long time, and by having them, you no longer need to go out and collect them anymore. Um, so they're essentially, we're going to learn a lot from them. We're learning how to better protect them in the wild. So essentially, they are the ambassadors for all the wild ones. That's how I like to look at it. They're the ambassadors. Are, we're we're going to uh, learn more to better um, protect them and better um, understand what they need to eat, how they survive. If we want to protect a certain land um, from you know development and that kind of thing. Um, so that's how I look at it. Um, uh, again, we have specimens that range all the way back from the 1940s, and they still look great. So we will never have to collect specimens from that area ever. Um, I take my, that's why I take my job very, um, it's very fun, but I also take it very seriously, because I don't want any of these animals to have died in vain. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's how we, we do get our specimens. Um, but again, that doesn't happen all the time. That's an, on occasion. 
That makes sense. And I love that approach of thinking of them as ambassadors for us to learn from and, yes. and protect these species moving forward. Absolutely. Um, Eva and Brenda were curious, what are those tags for on the specimens that you showed us? Very great observation. And thank you for reminding me. Um, yeah, so let me pull one so I can show you real quick. Um, so one thing I didn't mention earlier is that each specimen has a tag. We call it a museum number. Um, essentially, that's its ID. Um, so that's also part of my job. We have, I have a row of tags here. <laughs> for um, and string that I tie tags on the specimens. Essentially, this number, let's see if you can see it, is, um, is um, inputted into our database. All the information about the specimen, including its species, whether it's a male or female, whether it's an adult or juvenile, where it was collected, when it was collected, who collected it, and what kind of habitat is on our database. Essentially, all that information is um, accessible to researchers around the world. So it's a very great tool for people to know what we have exactly without them having to be here. So that's how they uh, are able to request certain specimens that they may wanna study. Because not only do we have specimens, which I didn't mention earlier before, from um, California, we have actually in the collection specimens from all over the world. In fact, we have one of the largest collections of Costa Rica in, in, the, in, the, in the United States. So yeah, we have, we have quite a few different types of, of specimens and that's actually something that I haven't quite even showed you yet. So yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. And that's good to know. We kind of have a library of specimens mm -hmm. similar to maybe how, yeah, you would identify certain library books in mm -hmm. the school library. Exactly. Um, great. Okay, curious about a couple of specific reptile related questions. Lexi is wondering, how do you know if the animal is a reptile? What makes a reptile a reptile? That's a great question. Um, so I often get um, um, questions about salamanders. And I often sometimes get in, in you know, with, with it's completely understandable. People often confuse salamanders for lizards. And it's understandable. They have a tail. They have four legs. So it's very lizard-like, right? Um, well, one of the biggest difference is, is that reptiles have scales. That's the main difference. One of the largest differences is that reptiles have scales and amphibians do not. So that's what makes them a reptile. Reptiles also lay eggs. They lay eggs, although they're not hard-shelled like that of a bird. Um, amphibians, their eggs are usually um, gel gelatinous, um, so they're kind of like like jello or jelly, and they usually <laughs> they usually um, lay them under. Um, some frogs will lay them under leaves, um, so they're moist. Or sometimes they lay them even in the water because they have to be moist. The advantage is that reptiles can lay their eggs almost anywhere because the shell keeps all the moisture within the egg. So um, so yeah, so that's one of the biggest biggest things of how you can tell whether it's a reptile versus an amphibian. Very cool. And Brenda was curious, are there any reptiles that can be found only in California? Yes, yes. So a few of the ones that I've mentioned, um, like the Western fence lizard, um, the Southern alligator lizard are mostly just in, in California. Um, in, in, and, um, and then you go up north, you get another array of different reptiles, but it's still within California. Um, so even within California, you find different types of reptiles that are only found within California. So you might have in Southern California certain types and up in Northern California, you have other types, but they're all still find, found only in California. And you do have some reptiles that cross the border. So you get some in Arizona, like the Gila monster. Um, and that's from the more desert. You won't see that around here. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, yes, there are. Mm -hmm. That's so neat. Um, let's see, Sienna and Francis are curious. Do you ever get scared um, when you've seen any of these animals maybe in the wild or with working with them in the collections? Yeah, good question. Um, so, um, no, when I'm, when I'm in the collection, no, but I do keep live reptiles as pets. And I know um, snakes, for example, are a, a common fear among, among people. 
And um, even with myself, I have a, um, a um, red-tailed rat, uh, rat snake and her whole body is green actually. And only the tip of her tail is red, which is so, what's a strange name. Um, anyways, she's a really beautiful snake and she's, all, she's, she's gonna get, get up to seven feet long. Um, yeah, and um, she's a bit of, um, she's very nervous. So um, I handle her often. And sometimes when she strikes, although her bites, she very, her teeth are not very large. So the most they do is just pierce the skin a little bit and I get a little bit of blood. I do flinch, so I get a little nervous. Um, and, and that's just a natural reaction. But um, what I say is um, if you're ever out and about and you see a snake, for example, out on a hike, definitely give the space, even if it's a lizard, give them their space. You can take a picture from a distance. Um, fear is is not nothing to be ashamed of, but also I like to try to change people's fears to more of a curiosity. I know not everyone's gonna love reptiles, but at least if they could just be like, oh, wow, I've never seen one of these before. That's pretty cool. I wanna take a picture and post it on social media or something and change that dialogue from fear to wonder. And I think that's more of a good way to look at it. I absolutely agree. I love that. In our live animal program, they always talk about changing the ew to ooh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Love that. All right. We have time for one last question, and it's a very popular question from a lot of students. Um, Alyssa, okay. Joshua, Cooper, and Aaron, and many others want to know, what is your favorite reptile or amphibian? Oh, that's the hardest question. <laughs> oh, okay. So... Uh, Gosh, okay, you, you you hit me with on the nail. Um, I have three favorites, and I know we can, we don't. You do you think we have time for those three favorites, or just pick Absolutely. one? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, okay, three okay. Faves. I think okay. I see them. So here's one, and I'll do this pretty quickly because I know we're gonna low on time. So this is not from California. In fact, not even from the United States. This is a thorny devil lizard. These are from Australia. You find them in the desert. And the reason why they're one of my favorites because they have such cool features and adaptations for living in the desert. They have all these spikes that are mainly used for protection. They have this false head that confuses a predator. predator. In addition, within the scales, they have these tiny little grooves that collect water. And this water is passively transported to its mouth. Living in the desert, this is a very important adaptation. In addition, its diet consists of ants only. So um, it's a just really, really cool, cool lizard. Um, and then the second one is this one. And actually, one thing I didn't mention, we also have skeletons in the collection. Um, I know this is going to be a little hard to see, but this is the only example I have of this type of species of reptile. And I'll show you actual picture so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So this is a skeleton of a flying or gliding. They also refer to as flying uh, lizards. They have these elongated ribs that they're attached to skin. And when they're threatened, they can... spread them out like that and actually glide from tree to tree. They can glide as long as far as 30 feet distance. So they're really cool. You find these in India. Um, they're like little dragons. Um, I even got a tattoo of one of them, of a skeleton. So you could see the, the, the ribs there. So yeah, so as you can see, <laughs> definitely one of my favorite lizards. And then the last one, it's a lizard that I actually discovered while working here um, and has become immediately to the top of one of my favorites. This, and I gotta take it out because it's just too cool. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit of a, a performance. <laughs> so this is a, they call it a dragon lizard or a sun gazer lizard. Um, these are from Southern Africa. They call them drag, uh, sun gazer lizards because they actually live in um, the grasslands and they inhabit um, these uh, tunnels. So when it's um, in the morning, when it's cool, they actually go up 
out of their tunnels and look up at the sun as if they're worshiping the sun because they're warming themselves up. In addition, but besides researchers to come to look at specimens, we also occasionally get people from the movie industry. And this lizard was photographed for reference for this fella, Godzilla 2014. So it was very cool when they came to take pictures of the sun lizards for reference and skin texture of Godzilla. It was a very, very fun, fun time. So after that, as I told you earlier, I'm a huge Godzilla fan. I, this lizard just instantly became one of my favorites. <laughs> well, I understand why you have three favorites because all three of those were so cool. And I just want to thank you so much for taking us into the collections and sharing with us. This has been awesome. You're very welcome. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank you so much to all of our students for joining today. I'm going to go ahead and close us out of our program. Um, thank you again to Naftali for um, sharing and joining us today and for all of our teachers and students joining. We thank you for spending time with us. We learned so much about the reptiles and amphibians of Los Angeles and beyond and the ways that we can study them. We can't wait to continue exploring more with you in this series. Um, if you want to see more from the Natural History Museum, you can give us a follow on Instagram at NHMLA. We'll also have videos of these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. If you have a second, we hope you'll answer one more question that we're going to post as an exit ticket um, on your way out. And otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.